Hi, Ed. Hi, uh, Michael. How are you doing? I'm all right. Good. Ah, okay. Die Chefin ist da. <clears throat> I'm going to try to do this without headphones on this time. Okay. I hope that that doesn't introduce any kind of technical artifacts. But I want to let your voices mingle in with the sonosphere that is you know, local to myself here. And let the two kind of become a hybrid instead of trying to artificially separate them. Ah, I see. Okay. <laughs> I have the windows open as well. Wow. A beautiful summer afternoon. So hopefully some of the some of the breath of my environment transmits through our digital ether. I'm sure that it will. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say my head is spinning from all of these uh conversations, this donat donatology and toroidology. <laughs> I haven't read the donatology thing yet. Oh, you don't know what you're missing, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> so do, do I need a cup of coffee for that one, or do I need a glass of wine for that one? Uh, Good yes. question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'd start with the coffee. Uh, you you'll, could, and you'll want to move on to the wine. You, uh, could, you could try uh, coffee with a good shot of Bailey's in it. And... <laughs> no, I've got bourbon and moonshine on my, on my shelf downstairs. Okay, see, hey, take your poison. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works. <laughs> Jeffrey, you mentioned it that it was four in the four a.m. where you are. I, but I thought you were in Qu Qu Quebec uh, City. Oops, you're muted. Mm -hmm. Unmute the man. Okay, try that again. You were you were just muted. Okay, normally I'm in Quebec, but right now I'm in Australia. Oh. So. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> as part of a sabbatical so it's the last few weeks here but uh, uh it's a it's a it's a what the tour de force to be to be present <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well it all depends you know i got up at four o'clock every morning for 40 years so <laughs> <laughs> i often get up at four in the morning three in the morning <laughs> I, I, I often sleep half the night and uh, <laughs> just out of anxiety and terror at the world. There you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Getting sucked into that black donut hole. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you just need more bourbon. Kind of, some kind of cosmic <laughs> digest, that digestion is occurring, I think. Maybe that's what our souls are, is food for the gods. Mm. We just pass right through them at the other end. <laughs> I've often had that feeling about life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm, there are, there are um, I think, resonances with these ideas in the last chapter. At one point, Sloterdijk talks about uh, Christianity as a sewage plant. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Love yeah. that one. It was kind yeah. of uh, curious. Uh, maybe we'll get to it. But I can't help thinking, I mean, honestly, I've, I've been affected by events of, you know, like this past weekend. And really, uh, these events happen, like the, the um, yeah. Charlottesville, North Carolina event. I'm just going to mention it. Uh, and they're not uh, surprising uh, at all, right? You, so you become, in a certain sense, accustomed to them. Nonetheless, they kind of worm their way into you. And even though on the surface you may have a sort of sanguine or a uh, equ equanimous disposition with respect to events that, that occur like this, they nonetheless kind of get into and be begin worming their way through. You know, they create, they create these, uh, this donut hole effect, I think, in, in the psyche. And so anyhow, I mean, I don't know. That's just uh, uh, why am I talking about that? Um, <laughs> be, because it's on, it's on my mind. And yeah. I'm, I'm sort of so I see space, we've all mixing spaces. Yeah. Hmm. I see we've all accepted the donutology rather than... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nothing got picked up as quickly as that one, Jeffrey. <laughs> I, I shared a, um, a poster, uh, a photo of a poster to the forum, and it says... It, I actually took the photo at the donut shop, 
down the street a few months ago because it seems so sometimes you come across these very um, everyday messages uh, mm. from like the sphere of marketing that, that seem to contain a me metaphysical joke <laughs> and uh, unbeknownst to, to the copywriter or perhaps be known to the copywriter. Uh, one doesn't know. Uh, but this was a promotional poster for the donut shop, uh, Winchell's Donuts, which is one of the few places in Longmont and pretty much the only place within walking distance from where I live that's open 24 seven. So uh -huh. when I would get up at three or four in the morning in, you know, state of uh, anxiety and terror, uh, I would go to the donut shop and I noticed this poster, which said in big block letters with, with a donut in each hand, anything mm -hmm. possible. Yeah. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I got this religious vision. <laughs> um, and it's, so I just, uh, 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 uh there's there's so many levels at which it seems that we're talking. It's very easy to kind of get confused <laughs> and to but, but I've always been drawn to donut holes, but donut holes are are really spheres, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Once they're extracted. <laughs> we haven't even moved on to the cronuts. This is the this was one of the later fads, I think it, on the East Coast, which was a croissant and a donut a mixed donut. into one. Uh, so the possibilities are endless. Um, I think it's, well, wait, what time is it? It's just a couple of minutes after. Yeah. I don't want to get started officially until maybe John joins us, joins us if he's going to. And um, Michael, perhaps. So, Wendy, uh, are you going to kick us off today? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to. I took notes as I was reading and then I was trying to like, you know, take seven pages of notes and condense them down to something uh, eloquent. So I've got maybe... I know the routine. Yeah. Maybe like five minutes of comments and then I kind of ran out of time right before we got into the whole Trinity thing. So I'll, I'll wing that part of my introduction, but um, yeah. I don't well, envy your task. I don't envy what, what, like, what your, your task here. <laughs> No, I was trying to, I did want to go back and look to see if this was the longest chapter of the book. <laughs> I think it was, actually. Although there was, a, there was a series there at the end where it was one picture on each page, where it yeah, was going yeah. through all the, like, permutations of the Trinity, which uh, was interesting. Um, okay, I would like to come back to that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I forgot where I didn't pick up on where those Trinity stations were like what church or what country those were in Did, do you remember no i don't i don't, I don't think uh, hey michael oh. you are also muted unmuted welcome yeah uh, uh i'm sorry i had a technical glitch here that's what happened so i apologize <laughs> oh we were just uh we were just swirling in uh, what was it, perichoresis? something like that. Yeah. Trying to approximate some kind of oh, yeah. some kind of uh, uh, surreal intimacy. What did we call it? Intimate surrealism. It was one of the other nice phrases here. So I think um, what we should do then, give it like another minute. See if John arrives, but then go into it. I'll let Wendy you lead us off, and we'll see where we go. Um, this, uh, yeah, was an interesting chapter, and uh, the discussions around it, and so forth. Um, so, uh, and then I think we should leave maybe fifteen minutes at the end to sort of ref not really reflect, like in any kind of. Uh, extended way on, on, you know, the completion of, of this first uh, volume, uh, but just kind of coordinate or kind of decide how we're going to move forward, when we're going to start again, if, when we start volume two, and talk a little bit about that, because I don't have a concrete idea necessarily. Uh, we could continue exactly as we're going. Uh, we could change it. Like, I, w I would like to open up a space at least for, hi, John. Um, for a conversation, which doesn't have to be completed today. We could take a, a couple of weeks, next, maybe the next two or three weeks to think on it and to you know, reflect and, and respond. 
Uh, but then basically to come to a decision on direction, on what world line, if you will, uh, this um, experiment is going to take. So, uh, Wendy, you could begin, and I will try to do a better job than I typically do on paying attention to the time. And maybe, you know, as we're approaching a quarter past um, the hour, then kind of flag us to to uh, bring it to a close. And and it will be to, to be continued. We'll move on to the next the next uh, sphere. Uh, so shall we begin? Sure. Okay. So when I went back and looked at all my notes and everything from the chapter, um, there are several intertwined concepts that I think Sloterdijk is presenting throughout this chapter. Um, I'm certainly not going to touch on all of them, but I'm going to try to grab the big ones. I think the three big ones for me were the examples of how different mystics in different traditions have approached the concept of the soul and the soul's relationship to God. Um, and then there was a lot of talk about uh, the language that we actually used to describe or explain this experience of God and the transference and the interconnectedness of all of that. Um, and then there's a large chunk that's devoted to this conundrum of Jesus Christ, essentially. Um, specifically, how do we reconcile the idea of a God who's all-encompassing, um, this you know, an all-encompassing entity with the idea of a son, a generational son, or a God-man who is both within the realm of God, presumably in heaven or around everything, but also a being that contains God within himself here, presumably on earth. So um, that kind of covers the, like, the big three things that kind of stuck out for me was I was reading the chapter. Um, Slaughterdike kind of starts the conversation with this idea of a primal relationship, um, this relationship being something that exists between us, our soul, and our God that essentially is always there. It has been preexistent before our birth. Um, and then I thought it was interesting. There was a brief discussion about where exactly this um, relationship, where in time this relationship was actually established between conception and birth. So I thought that was like an interesting tangent. I, my mind went down for a bit. Um, but once we are born and we have this human body, um, there seems to be a disconnect or a forgetting that we have this relationship with this godlike being. So for many mystics and clergy and psychologists, life becomes about seeking this relationship again, seeking it out. Um, and the question that Sloterdijk asks is, is this ensuing relationship with God something more akin to a human relationship where two strangers meet and there's a spark or something and the relationship seems to be spontaneous? Or is it more like you meet another person and you recognize, the, you know, a long lost friend or a long lost thing that you had some sense of you had possession possessing at one point and you've lost it, but now you've found it again. Thereby the relationship isn't so spontaneous. It's more inevitable because you got reconnected. Um, and what was interesting for me, you know, cause I'm always trying to connect it to stuff I already know and things I think about was the whole idea in quantum physics with quantum entanglement, where you've got this, these two particles that were at some point either connected or in relation to one another and then got separated over very, very large distances. But now, even with those long distances, they still have influence on each other. So if one is spinning positively, the other one might be spinning negatively. If the other one's going in one you know, direction, the other is balanced by going in the other direction. Um, so I kind of, actually kind of thought that fit in nicely with the idea of, you know, even though we have this, there might be a distance or there might be a separation between whatever this um, entity was in this primal relationship, but now we're here on earth and we're living our day-to-day -day existence, you know, we might still be connected cosmically through this idea of like quantum entanglement. So that was a kind of a nice brain tangent that I went down for a bit. <laughs> um, but what also it did too is I had the word entanglement stuck in my head. So anytime he mentioned later on in the chapter about intertwining or coherence or perichoresis or any of that, I kept hearing entanglement, entanglement, entanglement. And Sometimes it helped me understand the concepts that he was describing a little bit better because I have a better understanding of the physics of it. Um, whereas sometimes then it just was a completely contrasting. It didn't help me 
It didn't, it didn't help me at all understand what he was talking about. Um, and then following this introduction of the primal relationship, there were a lot of um, historic examples of different mystics and different people who were attempting to explain their relationship with their soul and with God. So they talked about Augustine and Marguerite Perete um, and the idea of giving up the self and becoming absorbed by God. Um, and then there was the Islamic martyr, Sue Hardy. Um, and the idea that maybe the soul is like a pre-existing angel that split off from God and then came down to earth and is now trying to get back to God. Um, Nicholas de Cusa and the idea that we see God and how he sees us. Um, the idea of us being eyes for each other, you know, like God is this all seeing entity, but he is also experienced. God is experiencing the world through us and looking through our eyes at what's going on. Um, and this was another thought experiment I went down. It was kind of a neat idea. The idea of the God looking through us, through our eyes is more of a laser where we're looking very narrowly focused on what's happening to us and what's right in front of us, as opposed to God being this all encompassing eye in the sky kind of a thing, looking at all of the pieces from a macro level. So again, that idea of the macro sphere and the micro sphere, you know, and, and the similarities and the differences between those. Um, and then he kind of got, and I, you have to forgive me. I didn't get much into my notes in this, the idea of once we were able to see through us and that we had almost like a part in how we viewed the world, that this idea of service and how the path to power was through serving God and his interests. And you know, it kind of, the, the conversation kind of lent itself a little bit to, um, I don't want to say a deficient model, but the idea that you now were kind of in control of your, I call it the master of your domain. You were the master of your domain. You can rule your kingdom as you see fit, as long as you keep in mind that your kingdom is just a subset of the larger kingdom of God. Um, and again, my thought experiment just went off because I'm like, well, how many kings, how many leaders have done really horrible things in the name of God? Because they can say, well, you know, I've, this is my vision and I've got his blessing and this is what I've been told to do. And we're going to, you know, go out. Um, and then not too long after the servitude concept, he gets into the bulk of the Trinity, um, concept and how, and this is where I kind of like, at first I was, it seemed like too much of a gear shift because we've been talking about spheres for so long and we've been talking about two points that you needed to make the sphere. And now all of a sudden he's bringing in a third as, you know, aspect of triumvirate and stuff like that. The only thing that helped me understand this was at some point he said about the Holy spirit kind of being that space in between those two points and then I'm like, okay, now my mind can kind of get this. Because when I was trying to think about a, a sphere with three points, made up of three points, I couldn't conceptually grasp that as much. Um, and as far as the actual chapter, um, he pretty much ends on the whole Trinity concept. And I do have notes on the two excursions, but we can talk about those maybe later. <laughs> hmm. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> that was excellent. So what pieces did everybody else like? Oh. <laughs> 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 <So it's muted. laughs> I, I had my usual uh, euphoria. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did notice. I always say very positively that it was in it was in this chapter and these ex, ex, uh, ex courses that he uses the word sphere the most in the entire book. I did go through and count. So <laughs> quantitatively, this is where he emphasizes that notionality the most. Well, he finally gets around it. He did he did a lot kind of in the first chapter, 
and I and I've missed it all along. I've I brought that up a couple of times, but I, I did notice that this time he's he's really back and he's really trying to get this sphere idea, which which I think is necessary if he's going to go to the next part where he has to expand on that. So it's, it's a good place to, to root it at any rate. So can, can I jump in there? Can you hear me? I can hear you, John. Okay. okay. Uh, something that was great, Wendy. Something you said reminded me of Eckhart's. Uh, when he says, my eye is a window, the eye, that I see. eye through which my eye is a window, and the eye through which I see God is the same eye that God, through which God sees me. Hmm. And I think that, to me, is a whole lot like the twist in a Mobius strip, where the inside and the out, where when you're in that twist, there's a blur or a paradox created because the inside and the outside, you're both inside and outside at the same time. I think that is even amplified when we look at that, the Kleinian, Kleinian bottle, you know, which where the inside and the inside, where the outside and the inside loop into one another and you have a that hole <laughs> where it's in between. Mm. It's profoundly indeterminate. And I think the only way we can get at this stuff is through the imagination. But the imagination is not to be confused with fantasy. And I think the deficient mental, we're all familiar with Gebser, so we've all gone through that journey. I think we're in the grips of the mental deficient, which uh, sees all of this visionary stuff as just imagination, either a regression to childhood magical thinking or pathological. I just want to make one quote from the American Psychiatric Association. The Diagnostic Statistical Manual says that belief in clairvoyance, telepathy, or sixth sense is a symptom of schizotypal personality disorder. All right. <laughs> I got it. I have it. And so, so, Count me in. Count me in. <laughs> and, and, and I think that so, could be a T-shirt. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that anybody who's had a dream <laughs> or has walked down the street and uh, had a synchronistic event. Um, or who, I mean, these experiences I've had of what is, you know, called out-of-body experience of lucid dreams, you can have a, what I would call extra-physical experiences. There's the physical senses and there's the extra-physical senses. And I think all mystical traditions have celebrated these visionary experiences, perhaps very gifted people, but I think ordinary people too respond to them because they have some capacity for that visionary experience themselves. So, and one more thing I'd like to just add is uh, something that I think we would relate to here is, because um, in a lot of, uh, we, we've been talking about the archaic, uh, the magical, the mythical, the mental, and the integral as stages. But I think that's a, something that's problematic because I don't think anyone is at an, the integral or at the mental or at the magical or at the mythical. There are events in which you perform either in a deficient or a, an efficient manner. So you can have integral episodes. You get you could probably have, you probably have lots of mental episodes where you're deficient or efficient. And I think this is happening a lot in our author here. I think he has a visionary capacity, a love of, of visionary discourse and a fascination with the experiences, but he's not coming clean. I don't think he's admitting that he's had these episodes himself for fear that he will be dragged off to the snake pit <laughs> you know? and he, that he would be, uh, you know, out of the step with a lot of his colleagues and a lot of the, the, the center of our scientific culture, which is very deficient mental. So, but I think his readings come, he oscillates a lot between the left brain, which has a lot of trouble with the location of God and the right brain, which it's not an issue for the right brain mm -hmm. where, where God, the place of God is. <clears throat> and I think this is a, 
I think this is in each of us can relate to this, this conundrum, because if you've had these experiences, you know, you have to keep them quiet or keep them secret where they can fester and become, I think, the source of a great deal of anxiety, unnecessary anxiety, or you, you have to find a, a community that is uh, able to register the effects of these experiences without getting swept away. And what I think Gebser rightly uh, warns us about the, the, the deficient magic of the deficient mythic. Mm-hmm. And he, we're all coming out of the deficient m- mythic. And I think he's looking at these, these scholars and these thinkers and these um, people who are having these altered states of consciousness and these visionary episodes, but they weren't regressing. They were actually, I think Kusa and Marguerite Perret and uh, certainly Eckhart, these were, these were uh, integral performances. I'm not saying they were coming, they were communicating from the integral, but they had mm-hmm. had these integral experiences mm-hmm. because they weren't in an age where that was even possible. And also, I don't think language is the best way to communicate this stuff anyway. It's probably dance or music or something like that. Anyway, that's my two cents. I, I hope that's helpful because I have, I have suffered a great deal of uh, anxiety about these experiences. And I think we're just starting to come into a kind of... Um, the field is starting to report back to us. And uh, if we're centered enough, I believe we can communicate, find a way of communicating better than we have before. And ways that make sense to the metaphorical constructs that we use. Anyway, I got more to say, but I would rather. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you for your patience. It's very hard to talk about. Can, can I add just one, one, one side note? Um, since um, uh, John did bring up Gapeser, and, and, and he is very often looked upon, and a lot of people interpret his structures as stages, but he emphatically, emphatically denies that they should be stages. They right. are structures. So, as, as you so correctly pointed out, you can, let's say, find yourself in any structure at any, any moment in time. You, right. you may also Every day. think, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm doing this real mentally, and, it, and you're really operating on a very magical or mythical mode, let's, let's say, and that's possible. So they're, they're always present all the time, but which one is being accentuated or expressed or brought out or, or communicated or however we want to describe or, it. Or repressed. Or, 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 repressed. And, or, or yeah, attacked. It goes, yeah, yeah. it goes in all directions. That's I agree. Right. I agree. Yeah, that, that's all I wanted to add there. That's great. I had something to say about this, um, um, and it's going to sound a bit odd. um, because (laughs) Go for it. (laughs) Which is to say normal. (laughs) Slaughter Dick, the whole, I mean, I found it, I did find it interesting reading this. I have, I've tried to read Augustine. Uh, I, I get, pushed back by the heavy Christian flavor of Augustine. It really is hard to get into for somebody who who's doesn't live that kind of mentality, but I have tried. And uh, so I did a, kind of appreciate his description of all this and the Trinity and all the rest of it. But my understanding about spirituality and religion is... Uh, like I didn't really learn anything from Slaughter Dicks. It was like a portrayal of things that are already out there in a kind of an intricate and detailed way for which I did learn some things, but it didn't really change my perspective on these things. I tend to think about spirituality. I'm more interested in spirituality and, and religious feeling as an emergent phenomenon than something grounded in our past experience. And all of Slaughterdick's stuff is this building out from past experience. But I'm interested in, in what, how the future pulls us forward rather than how the past pushes us forward. And this pulling, so it, it's not very Christian because, well, it, it can be, I suppose, but it's probably a mystical Christian rather than the, traditional Christian, but this idea of being pulled forward, I have these other ideas about the fact that we all think that we live forward in time, that we come from our past and we, and our character is determined by our past, but I actually think some of our character is determined by our future, 
not in a deterministic way, but in some sense, mm -hmm. who we become affects who we are now. And so I'm interested in these reverse time things. Uh, and they're not standard in any way. So I was a bit disappointed that this, it, well, I shouldn't be disappointed because, of course, that's slaughter dick all through and through. But it's, it's this <laughs> growing out rather than this, this coming into being of something new, right? It's mm. all coming from the past forward. Uh, and so I was a little bit disappointed and it, it, it ran a little bit counter the kind of ways that I like to think about things. So I'm, I'm on my reverse slaughter dick uh, flank of the mountain right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd like to, I'd like to echo Jeff, Jeffrey. I'd like to echo you. I had a similar response with this. He begins the chapter with a list of summarizing all these different spherological dimensions, which are all, you know, womb, very early childhood, right? And, uh, you know, the re I could be wrong, but the reading I'm getting is that, similar, Jeff, to what you're saying, is, is that it's all tied to these early experiences, which overdetermine everything that comes forward. And any emergence is something like a substitute or compensatory mechanism for certain, for certain losses that have occurred in these early processes. So I read this chapter. I think the analyses of Augustine and Cusa are brilliant. I think these are nuanced readings about discursive origins out of Augustine and, and so on. And so they're valuable in my own kind of research into Christian art and culture. But I, I actually think they're, they're actually, he's actually trying to translate these into his ferological thesis. So the Trinity, the folds of the Trinity, right, are really just, you know, God the Father is the, is the sphere that protects me, right? I'm the separate being that wants to reconnect with God. And the medium for this reconnection, the energy, this is the loose reading of it, is spirit. And what that really is, is the primal, the primal wound needs something in adult life to compensate for it in some sense. Even Augustine's echo of the, uh, the Trinity and the soul, or the form of confession with God's presence and the ways God is present in the confession, seem to me the same kind of folding that really is translating into this master narrative of spherological compensation. And I don't think that's true. I don't think that's real. I think that's a retro-romantic reduction. I think there are real emergences that aren't just compensations. Mm -hmm. And I think that humans were not born to be in the womb. That's a process that gets us into life. <laughs> mm -hmm. It just does. It's to, it's to get us into life. I don't know how else to get here. <laughs> and, and I'll just hold this book up. I'm by mistake in a, um, this goes to what John was saying. I'm, I'm hey. in a, oh, hey! <laughs> there we go. My I, quote was from this book about yeah. the American Psychiatric Association. Exactly. They quoted it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in a, I'm by mistake, and I mean this because I have no professional competence in an amazing group that Leslie Coombs formed in consciousness studies, and I'm like an outsider watching this. But I've accumulated enough, including a book like this, to have learned, and I'm trying to be objective, that the actual scientific data that has come forward on things like telepathy and so on so statistically are impossible by chance events. Mm -hmm. in terms of meta-analyses, that traditional explanatory mechanisms that use a subject-object materialist, you know, these variants of ontology, they don't work. No. And, and, and there's more to be said for that. So just taking something like that, which is summarized in, Bara in, in Barassa's book, um, and other studies like the Maharishi effect that was studied and reported in David Nichols' book, um, I, I just think Slaughterdyke is is collapsing yeah. a, a dimension of actuality. 
that's mm-hmm. available, which leads to very high levels of well-being and increased capacity development that are not simply compensatory. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in terms of the, the states, whatever you want to call them, the leading research I've seen on this is by a man named Jeffrey A. Martin, who's going to publish a book called The Finders. And he has done an amount of research on these expanded states of consciousness that is, I think, unprecedented. And he thinks of himself as a cognitive scientist. And, you know, the older models of witness, non-dual, forget it, but he has a whole different map called locations. And they're both developmental and typological. And he's got tens of thousands of data. He's got brain waves. He's got the whole bit. And the levels of well-being that occur from these locations are absolutely astonishing. And then capacities to move in the world radically shift. And in, in, the, in, in locations two through four, there is no sphere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the mm-hmm. spheres are gone. Yeah, imagine that. Metaphor. <laughs> no container. There's no inside or outside. You exactly. know, it's gone. It's and there's gone. both inside. There's both inside and outside, and there's not inside. And there's not, yeah. 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 And these later yeah. ones, just, who knows, no one's even considering this. So there are forms of evolved being, I would call them evolved being, that are available um, that don't need this compensatory mechanism on the one hand. And on the second, there are dimensions of the real that I would say, or at least pointing to it, that aren't explained in what I think is a somewhat reductive account a kind of psycho and analytic psychology that's being pressed back in quasi Heideggerian terms into the womb. Mm-hmm. That's what I see him doing. And having said that, I want to read everything he's written because his, his ability to analyze texts and mount materials like these obscure passages in Ficino are like, for me, they're amazing. You know, he's just amazing. So I, I've become a Sloterdijkian reductionist in ta- calling him a reductionist. That's how I would describe myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'd love to hear how I'm I'm completely off in this. <laughs> no, I, I have a thought about on this though, uh, because it might. Be, well, let me put it this way: I, I think we might want to distinguish between um, what we might call subtle phenomena, psychic phenomena, uh, psychic capacities, um, the kinds of things that, you know, lucid dreams, the kinds of things that you're talking about, Michael and and John, that you've uh, brought up, um, you know, multiple times. And what I think is a a slight difference in terms of what Sloterdijk is, is I think, actually addressing, which he describes not in terms of the validity of the phenomena themselves, whether that's the mystical experiences of the, the church fathers or um, of, you know, the, the psychedelic, you know, fusion in the Berlin love parade. I don't think he's commenting necessarily on the validity of those experiences. He talks in this chapter about the strong relationship, uh, which is a quality of relationship that is, I think, distinct from, or at least in contrast to what he ends the chapter on, which is this world of alienation uh, from others, this Heideggerian uh, sense of being lost in others, lost in the day, lost in, in a reduction or in a flatland, as Wilbur put, and others put, puts it. Uh, and, and the sense that the, that strong relationship, that interbeing or that interintelligence, whatever the phenomena happen to be, physical, transphysical, whatever, but the quality of that relationship seems to have disintegrated uh, in the modern, in the deficient mental, um, in the scientific, uh, what have you. And the, I see him going back to this trinity, because I was curious why it's such a claustrophobic world. When you think about it, you go around and around, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Spirit Holy Spirit, Father, Son, all the permutations and complications of how they, you, you, why would you, it would be absurd, in other words, to posit that as the ideal state, as the, as the objective. Um, I think he's going back to it for a different reason, not, not to comment on whether or not it's metaphysically true, but to assert, I think, that 
there is something that was there. There was something that was being thought more maybe to the point, something being felt and something being experienced, uh, which has these dimensions that he lays out in terms of the seven steps from the heart, the face, uh, the womb, the placenta. And interesting that there were seven, by the way. Um, but there's a quality of relationship that perhaps he's seeking to reacquaint us with. Uh, and we're not going to find it by going back and becoming Augustinian or Neoplatonic Christians. Uh, he doesn't. He hasn't yet, I think, disclosed or explored uh, in the text how that it might become emergent and how it might not be just coming from the past. I mean, the whole discourse, the whole question on time, right? And where is God uh, in time? Where is God in space? That is very interesting um, because that's not addressed in deficient rational science. That is becoming addressed in emergent science and emergent arts and emergent studies in, in general, the kind of research that maybe, Michael, you're, you're connected yeah, with. This, uh, this there. Stuff. Yeah, that right. guy, that's the meta book of the meta-analyses. Right. right. So, so, but that's not just first-person experience of an objective reality. That's a, a whole different kind of experience. But it is relational experience. And there's a difference between a psychedelic experience, for example, or a transcendent experience that is just a visual display of other worlds or what have you, and an experience that's inner in, in, in the sense in which I think he's talking about with the in, the inhood or the inness, that's inner and inter. And what that is that we space, I don't see this as a really a form of we space theory, what some integral you know, thinkers are calling we space theory. Um, that might be a more language kind of neutral way of, of describing it. But I, I think it's something a little bit different, in other words, than, than just about the openness that he may or may not have to psychic and subtle ex, uh, phenomena and perspectives. I think he's open. I just, don't, I just think he misinterprets them. And I think there's a lot of um, support for those misinterpretations. Um, because we live in a profoundly monophasic culture. And I think this is something we each can work on. If, if we use the future as a, um, and maybe we can be pushed from the past and pulled from the future and healthy in a direction that's healthy or healthier. Um, but I think we need to become more poly, a polyphasic culture where different phases of consciousness are honored and acknowledged. And I think this is something, you know, Gebsu was into. And if you look at magical, mythic, the archaic, the archaic is, this, we experience that in our 24 hours, we go to sleep, you know, we go into the delta, into deep sleep. This is where babies operate most of the time then we can enter into the magical. Um, that would be the transition between sleep and wake. This is where babies and children hang out most of the time, where synchronistic and a-causal events occur. This would be the theta range. Then we can go into that mythic where everything becomes cyclic and that's when we end engage with narrative and story. This is awake and resting states. Usually you have your eyes closed when you go into these kind of reveries. Um, or trans states. And then we have that, that mental where everything is linear and causal and scientific and materialistic usually. And I think we're breaking out of that. This is the, where we're alert, we're active, we're thinking, the cognitive, the mapping, able to, uh, that's given high priority over the affective. And then I think we're moving into this transparent phase, the integral phase. And I think this is the higher octave that Gebser was uh, predicting. And I think that is the future, a healthy future that we can move towards if we, as we start to coordinate these various phases of consciousness and without uh, giving any priority or uh, marginalizing any of them. But I don't think we are, are anywhere close to that, except our pop culture. I think our pop culture is very uh, informative as, as we tap into these different uh, these different states, some of the magical, mythical, predominantly, I think our culture's into this uh, sci-fi kind of mythology. Mm -hmm. 
And then there are those integral flashes we can all get, but we can get them every day. We can get them in every hour. We are, you know, we have ultradian rhythms. We have diurnal rhythms. We have these uh, sleep-wake rhythms. We have the heart uh, pulse. We have the, the breath. We have all these rhythms happening simultaneously and are coordinated with one another. So I think of, I think the metaphor for me is the fractal flower, that uh, all these different kinds of time and different kinds of spaces, our body is a place for a coordination of all of that. So we need all the help we can get. <laughs> but I don't really think we're getting much of it from the American Psychiatric Association. Because <laughs> they will, they will uh, numb us with their Zoloft and Xanax and all of these drugs. Where I think people are, are having these angst experiences because they want to coordinate these different paces of consciousness, but they're being stopped. And I think our culture is driven by, you know, competition, late, mm -hmm. late capitalism with all these kinds of uh, pseudo problems that were being presented. So anyway, but I think it's hopeful. I think it's very hopeful that uh, if enough of us pay attention to our attention and where we're putting our attention, we can um, actually um, start to actualize some of these potentials. Mm -hmm. So that's my big, big spiel. <laughs> Thank you. It's great, great to have a place, a space that's safe enough so that, you know, we can experiment with how to communicate these kinds of things. No, this, I think this all goes very deep. And one, there was a post, I think, Jeffrey is in the, in the forum, um, beginning to tease out how questions of form are not just questions of form. Like they, they have a very direct relevance uh, for our life experience potentially and uh, so what may appear to be a, a mathematical or um, you know merely mental um, or psychic or what have you or dream visionary type of uh, contemplation you know it actually has uh, uh, co consequences potentially you know it has relevance uh, and that what for like why are we reading this why is this why are we even talking? Uh, we could be doing any number of things in any number of possible universes, but there, there is something that we, I feel that there's something we want to get to. Uh, mm -hmm. There's something Slaughterdyck wants to say. That's what you said, Ed, is what is he saying, mm -hmm. right? Um, we don't even know what he's saying. How do we know what he means? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's very. I, I do want to note that you said that, not me. This time. <laughs> okay. I was just a bit serving the uh, well, yeah. serving the, the author. <laughs> I was just a sub-author in that statement. No, no, there is. If 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 I can add to that, my my problem with with Sloterdijk in 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 this final chapter in particular has to do with the fact that in the last reading that we did, he categorically denied that there's anything like a soul. He, he doesn't understand angels. He doesn't have any, any real relationship to this. And, and the problem I think he has is he knows that enough of us believe in that crap. I'm going to use the word consciously. At the we believe in all that kind of crap. And we deal with it, we wrestle with it all the time yeah. in our own little ways. And, and he knows it's there, but it shouldn't be. Basically, in his world, he's, he's a, he's a dyed-in-the-wool materialist. And, and he's like the Dennett's and the, and the Dawkins. That, that, it can't be. But it is. He recognizes that it's there, and it is. But it actually can't be. And so that's why I find, I think Michael's comment was, was, very, was very poignant. He, he ends up in this re, the reductionism because it's the only way he can get to it. And it's the only, because he has to root it somehow in our biology. And I don't know, I don't know if you have to go through that torturous path to get there, but he apparently needs to do that or has to do that. And that's for me why after 650 pages, we're all sitting here going, well, I think, and maybe, and it could be. And because he just won't say, shit, I wish I, I had a better handle on this. That, that would have been an honest statement. You know, we're all, we are trying to get a better handle on it. That's what we want to do. And so we grope and we, we, we stumble and, you know, we do whatever it is. 
but but he's he is in a situation where he has to come across as some kind of authority of some sort. But he's but he's he's got his shoelaces tied together before he can start running, and then he falls. And I'm going, hmm, well, <laughs> and help me there. <laughs> You know, he, he, uh, he's written a lot and they're all big books. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. He's I never at a loss for that, words, Michael. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I, so I know that his second book was talking about Nietzsche's materialism. Mm. Oh, boy. No, but, but, and then, um, he's been critical of Frankfurt School critical theory and mm. he's, trying to advance some form of a um, post-Nietzschean genealogy that's very much about affirmation, that's affirming about things, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. energetically moving this way, you know, mm -hmm. avoiding the slave morality move, of reactivity away. And, and thirdly, um, this is all superficial, you know, the follow-up to this, this trilogy where, uh, was, is a book called You Must Change Your Life, Mm. And it's all about anthropotechnics and it's all about development, <laughs> mm. the call to develop oneself in the contemporary world. <clears throat> so, you know, when I hear Mar Marco, when I hear you speaking, I hear a lot of nuance of allowing for something in the gist of what I'm saying, but opening up a space of otherness as well for something else to come forward as well with mm. what he's performing. And I'm, I don't, I'm intrigued by it. You know, I'm open, you open me up to that possibility, that space. I, I can just speak that. I mean that sincerely. He may be much more dimensionalized than I'm giving him credit for, but I like being a reductionist. Mm -hmm. And then projecting and accusing the other to be a reductionist. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's very joyous. <laughs> With a donut in each hand, anything is possible. <laughs> <laughs> I would actually, I would like to ask Wendy a question because Wendy, you introduced a term in a private communication uh, that intrigued me and that I think we could relate back to um, a, 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 a piece of this chapter. And the term was media soul. And you, would, you, met, you used that term. That didn't come from Sloterdijk. But in Sloterdijk, we find media theory, and he puts it in quotes. And so he's putting it, he's problematizing it a little bit. But part of what I, I am hypothesizing is that we're going to come to a conception of our media that is somehow ensouled. And I, I wonder if you might expand on this idea of a media soul at least as as you might have intended it uh or not when you, you mean in the, uh, in the cyborg conversation the cyborg rights conversation yeah that's right that's where it came up well in the cyborg rights conversation it was this idea of um expanding the idea of connectedness through our devices and the devices um enable us to share each other's thoughts, connect on some level. I mean, even just, you know, to John's point, we've got six people here who are free and capable of sharing intimate experiences in a, in a, in a room that technology has enabled us to do this. I mean, we're in four corners of the globe here um, and we're able to share our souls, so to speak, through this idea. <laughs> You know, so then, you know, in the terms of the cyborg rights, then, you know, if we need this connectivity and we need these ex shared experiences in order to feed our souls, literally, um, where does the barrier then become between what's us and what's our technology? You know, that barrier is going to blur because, you know, if I need this experience, if I need to come into, into this space with you, with you five other people to have this conversation, and if I somehow am deficient, if I don't have that, then the technology that enables me to do this becomes as vital to me as breath, or as vital to me as food, or shelter, you know, a place to have, literally a container to have this conversation in. Um, so then, you know, the you know, kind of like that cyborg concept, the, 
you know, that there, there's that perichoesis of our ethereal soul, ephemeral soul, with something very concrete as far as ones and zeros and energy. Um, and I think that was something else that you picked up on, Marco, is, you know, there's a lot of what Sloterdijk says and what a lot of the concept of the soul and the concept of God, you know, can, in my mind, is equated to energy. And that feeling, that impulse, that, you know, reverberation, that, you know, feeling of substance that you can't necessarily see, but you feel at a visceral level. Um, you know, an energy, you know, if you look at computers and if you look at even brain frequencies and waves and stuff like that, it's, it's really kind of comes down to ones and zeros, either the energy's there or it's not. And a certain pattern of energy transmits one thing and a certain pattern of ones and zeros transmits something else. So it's, it's not a far stretch, especially where we are now with technology and where we think it might be going to um, realize there's not much difference between this ephemeral soul and the energy that's driving it and the energy that makes all of this conversation even possible. So I'm not quite sure if that's where we're going, <laughs> <Yes>. but <laughs> I, I think the technology, the way we're using it, is very. Um, I think we're moving in a very healthy direction, or I wouldn't be here if I didn't think so. Um, but I don't think my most of my experiences with the technology is dealing with the shadow of our current circumstances, of what I would call m- mental deficiency. So um, I think we we can we have to deal with both. And I think we're in this transition. Um, and we don't know how this technology is going to be used. It could be used to, you know, reinsert um, totalitarian regimes in a way that have never been possible before or something else, um, which we, we probably haven't defined particularly well. So I'm hoping we can. Um, I do believe, I just want to add one thing. This is not from this text um, Schlotterdijk, this is from um, Henry, Henry Corbin, whom he quotes, who, who's working more with the Sufis than he does with the Christians. Mm. But he, he's a real hero of mine because he works with the, uh, the imagination and the imaginal. And his, um, he works a lot with these, these boundaries and where the boundaries get blurred and where these, these um, Mobius strip-like twists occur. And He's talking about, I think, um, about prayer. He says, prayer is not a request for something. It is the expression of a mode of being. This view of prayer takes the ground from under the feet of those who, utterly ignorant of the nature of the imagination as creation, argue that God, who is the creation of our imagination, can only be unreal, and that there can be no purpose in praying to such a God. For it is precisely because he is a creation of the imagination that we pray to him and that he exists. Prayer is the highest form, the supreme act of the creative imagination. Now, that could be interpreted in many different ways, and I'm not quite there yet. But I think if we could use the technology um, to sort of um, tap into these visionary capacities, which we all have, um, and start to refine our skills, our meta skills and our uh, skills for uh, paying a, uh, paying attention to what other people are paying attention to. This has been a big thing in my mind here, is how do we cultivate those capacities, those visionary capacities and refine them um, so that, that we can move forward a, a, a more interesting agenda. And I think it's being delivered to us by Microsoft and Monsanto. <laughs> anyway, that's my, a little bit of my desired outcome I'm trying to formulate here. Can I ask I wanted a to come back to, No, go ahead, Jeffrey. Go ahead. I was just going to say I really liked your um, coming back to this idea of strong relation, Marco, because I think that is, if there's one thing in this chapter that I think is strong, speaks more strongly to me, it's that idea of strong relation. And it has this, for me, it has this potential of being pull as well as push. I mean, a strong relation as push 
is interesting, but strong relation as pull from so emergent phenomena can have can have resonance with this notion of strong relation. So I, I, I do think it's a, a key concept in the chapter and and brings me back to the things that I do like about Slaughter Day. Uh, as opposed to the things I seem to be on right now, which are the things I don't like. But, uh, uh, Johnny mentioned shadow. I think this is another thing. Slutterdick doesn't talk very much about shadow. No, he's uh, afraid of young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, to some extent, what he's been doing is illuminating or trying to illuminate what's going on inside the sphere of the self, if you like. And if you cast a light around, well, you're not going to create much shadow there, but there is shadow, right? So it, it and perhaps that is dealt with in volume two, because I, I'm sort of, I haven't read it, but I've, I'm, I, I know it deals with more shadow issues at a, at a broader scale than the mm-hmm. self. But um, so, but it will be interesting to explore the idea of shadow. And I also need to think a little bit more hard about this entanglement issue that um, Wendy brought up, because I think uh, the connection between entanglement and these, uh, the strong relationship, let's say, uh, in, a, in a way, is worth delving into more. I would no, agree. I'll let you go, Ed. Okay, <laughs> so I, I just I have one curmudgeon question. <laughs> we we couldn't let this go without it. But the, I see I agree with this strong relationship, and and that's what we're building here. Johnny's pointed that out more than once. You just re, reinforced that, uh, Jeffrey. And it and it means a lot because we're we are able to get together and create a space where we can exchange ideas without fear and intimidation. And if this were 200 years ago, we would we would be meeting in the back room of pop <laughs> underground, pop. yeah, yeah, yeah. We, somewhere across town, mm-hmm. and because we would be physically, spatially near to one another, but we wouldn't praise the buildings that we're in. That we can sit there and have this conversation, <laughs> but we sit here and 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 get this euphoric gush about digital technology, which is nothing more than creating an artifice within which we can can carry on a conversation. And so that's why I, I get a little, I get a little bothered by all of this, what the technology is doing. Okay. Maybe last century we would have gotten into planes and, and met somewhere, you know, but we, we don't, we don't get overwhelmed about how, cars and airplanes and telephones do all of these things. But for some reason, as soon as it becomes digital, it becomes something else. Well, no, it's just, it's just newer than the other ones were, but it's still just a tool to allow us to do something that we're taking advantage of, which I think is exactly why, why it's there. That, I mean, to me, that's what technology is for. When I want to put a nail in the wall, I go get a hammer. You know, I don't get my shoe and I don't get a screwdriver and I don't get a wrench, even though I've used all of those things in my life simply because I was too lazy to go get the tool. But <laughs> but there are tools to do these things. So we use them. And I'm going, well, that's great. You know, so let's use the tools. Now, now that we that we are in a position with the ubiquitousness of the digital digital world allowing these tools to perhaps dominate us more than they should be. That is perhaps an issue that's also worth thinking about. But it has nothing to do with, 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 with how, you know, the specialness of this. It's simply, um, you can use, well, people have ever since there have been hammers and axes, they've used them to kill other people, you know. Yeah, I mean, you can use things other ways. There's, there's lots of ways to use an axe. It just doesn't have to be to chop wood. And so I don't see why the digital technology is suddenly different than any of that. It's simply that we probably wouldn't have been together because we're so spatially far apart from one another, but we're obviously conceptually, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally closer to one another than lots of other people that are in our own hometown, hometown, if not in our own houses sometimes. 
in certain aspects, you see. So that, that's why I, I just always wonder like, okay, so what's so special about it? I think, what, I think what's special maybe is, you know, I agree with you completely. I, I, I use the tool analogy all the time. You know, technology is great, but you need to have the right tool for the job. There's no point having, you know, a gaming machine when all you want to do is play solitaire. What's the point? Yeah. You know? But I think, and maybe I misspoke, and maybe we, again, this language thing, maybe the, it's the information and the, um, I don't want to say data, because that's not the right word either, but it's the, it's the transmission of the message that is being sent through the technology that is what I'm saying. It might be a lifeblood for some people. It's, you know, it's, it's not so much the physical, it wasn't the telephone that made the conversation great. It was the conversation that happened over that telephone wire that made the relationship and made the energy worthwhile. So, I, I mean, I definitely do see your point, Ed, and I see, you know, to Johnny's point too, is like, you know, what are we doing with technology? This can go to hell in a handbasket very, very quickly. And I'm very well aware of that. I mean, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm intrigued right now by this whole concept of big data and mm -hmm. how they're using stuff that's being, you know, it can't help but be stored because we can store it now. But the question yeah. then becomes who owns it and what devious things can be done with it, you know? On the flip side of that, there's some really, really good things that can come out of it. We can like predict, you know, based on mosquito counts and based on disease trends and based on weather patterns, where the next epidemic may come from. Well, gosh, if we had a little bit of insight into where that might flare up, we might at least be able to prepare a little bit. We're not going to be able to mitigate mm -hmm. everything, but that could be a good outcome of that use of that kind of data. But, you know, to Johnny's point, we could all get chips inserted into our head and be forced to drink Coca-Cola and eat McDonald's for the rest of our lives. We don't know. It could go either way. So, um, again, it's, it's that happened. message. That's how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just that when you look back at history, um, we've had lots of wonderful technologies, but for somehow, somehow they all seem to go to hell in the handbasket sooner or later. Well, you know? I, I'd like to think it might be different this time around, but I'm not seeing indications that it's going to be. Okay, let's put it that way. But that's just the curmudgeon speaking. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't my field, really, so I'm a newbie here, but I understand technology like microscopes and telescopes are just mimicking the visual system. Mm -hmm. So we can see ranges that are beyond our physical eye, mm -hmm. but a lot of those uh, instruments are mimicking a physical sense that we have. And I think the um, – so whatever new technology comes along, it's, it's whether it's telephones or it's phonographs or – tape recorders, I mean, it's mimicking certain physical systems that are already, we're already using, or, and probably amplifying. And then the, the feedback we get changes our physiology because uh, we're coupled with our environments. And if I'm, so that's why my attention is very um, perturbed because I'm coupled with an environment where many people are interacting with a technology which is mimicking our physical senses, and then reporting back and changing the physiology and the rhythms of our communication capacities. I think what happens is we start to internalize. I mean, when I, I dream, sometimes I lose a dream, and there, there are computers there. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm interacting with them in dream states. These, uh, so, these trans, so there are computers in the transphysical, these transphysical realms. I remember I had one episode, this was a number of years ago, where I ended up in this space and I said, I asked for some help or is there teachers, is there someone who could direct me? And there was just a, there was a computer and this guy in a white coat appeared and he said, uh, look into, he says, uh, we can't help you, but you can help us. We would like to uh, study your brain. And I said, sure, fine. And they, so he said, look into that the computer look at the blue light and there was a little blue light that was pulsing and then it went right into the center of my dream head my mm -hmm. physical head was in the bed asleep but the dream head experienced this blue light moving in and out and i think there is a, a relationship between the subtle this para brain that they were studying in my physical brain um and then they said thank you very much and they went away and i woke up in bed and i wrote it down in my journal and i thought about it but I'm, I'm starting to realize there's this, uh, that the, the, the technology that we're using is, is uh, changing 
our rhythms and our physical experience. And uh, we're in communion. With, hopefully, we're communicating with each other. But I think um, a lot of our communications are getting are amplifying um, a lot of the, uh, the the shadow work that mm. has not been accomplished by most people. <laughs> That's why I think we have the president that we have today. Mm. Anyway, I'm just putting that out there because I think there's an intimate relationship with the technology that we have created, how we use this technology, and how the effects of that technology uh, can change us for, for, for good or for evil. And I say evil because I mean evil. So I'm somebody who works with um, people with disability all the time. And uh, people with disability, if they didn't have technology, the other way. would not be able to do very much. Mm -hmm. Technology is what... It, now... Technology that enables people with disability might be a walking cane. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be very high tech, but it's mm -hmm. still technology, a walking cane yes. or a pair of glasses. Yep. We don't call people who have poor eyesight disabled because they wear glasses and that allows them to function. So, and glasses is technology too. So I think technology is built into being human. I think from the very start, humans had technology or very, very quickly after the sort of formation of what a human being was developed or used technology in some way. And I, I think, so I think we have to be a bit careful about this sort of, I mean, we have to be aware of the bad side and the good side and the, and the possibilities of both, but I don't think we can say we should get rid of it. <laughs> I, no. I, I, don't, I didn't say no, no. that. I never would have, and I, that's, that's the last thing on my mind. It's simply keeping it, I'm not saying keeping it in this place, but, but looking at it for what it is. It, is. it can be an enabler, and that is, the good, that is good. I, I'm all for that. I, th I think that's great. I think walking canes are good. I certainly couldn't do it on eyeglasses. I can tell you that. I haven't been able to most of my life. But, but what, what gets me, not that anybody here has, has fallen into that, that trap. I, I, I did a degree in um, online distant education. And I can tell you that there are evangelicals, te technological uh, evangelicals that can put our Christian brethren to shame <laughs> in how this is going to save us from whatever, you know. And no, it's, it's a tool. Just like, just like I liked your, your comments earlier, Jeffrey, on how you approach spirituality and religion, because you're looking for, well, how, how does it contribute to who I am and what I'm trying to do? And how does this arise? You know, there's, there's other questions that can be asked other than this determines my life and therefore I am because of that. So, and it's that, it's that exuberance, that over gushing, oh my God, where would we be without it? Well, we'd probably be where we are. We would just be without it. <laughs> we're always where we are. <laughs> let me ask a question. Um, is well, let me ask this. It's a rhetorical question. Is technology a tool, or are tools part of technology? That's one part of it. So I'm just going to make that distinction. Two is, and this comes up in Heidegger. So it'd be interesting to make the connections here. I won't. I won't go there quite yet. But um, when we have a tool. What Heidegger says, it's something that's ready to hand. You use the hammer. You, you have the hammer. You can hold it in your hand. You can use it, hit the nail, accomplish the task that suits your purposes, and then put it down. But that's not what technology is. That's what a hammer is or what a tool is. Technology, in the sense that I think Sloterdijk is getting to it, or what, Jeffrey, I think you just presenced uh, the constitutive nature of it, it also creates, not, one, an environment. But two, I think that there's a stronger uh, position to take there, or a stronger statement to make about it, which is that it creates a medium for our being. That's a big leap, though. I, I think that this idea of a, what is media, when we talk about the, the, our digital environments or our physical environments, our rooms, including the tools we use or the, the ways that we amplify our senses, uh, and I'm reminded that McLuhan dis defines technology as the amplification of, of our senses. And we may, we don't only have five senses. Uh, right. I was listening to a podcast actually with McLuhan's son talking about the father and the son. His son is also a media theorist and, and the grandson is a sort of um, art artist slash media theorist. 
He was on a podcast called Entitled Opinions with Robert Harrison and referenced a work, which I'd love to go back to, on the, on, on the description of many different kinds of senses, up to 20, 30 senses, something like that, that are you know, categorized and described more, more uh, uh, in depth. And if the, you think then that each of those senses could be amplified and enhanced technologically, so that not, rather than just having the eye, we have vision, uh, mm -hmm. television, uh, mm -hmm. macro vision, mm -hmm. micro vision, etc., um, and that 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 is not other than our lived environment. Then I think that we could begin to trace the the sort of where the media theory how deep the media theory really goes, because if our original media as human beings is the womb and then the placenta, et cetera, well, it doesn't mean that we stay there, but, it, but we keep moving into new media. And part of what is happening technologically is that our medium that are just to give that a big blobby sort of sense of, about it is rapidly transforming. It's becoming something very other. It's forcing us to transform, to adapt to it. And we've, entered into this sort of feedback cycle, this rapid exponential feedback cycle where we've become so adept uh, with our tools that we've completely altered our environment, created this kind of Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. Now we have to use the tools on ourselves in order to adapt to the environment that we've created through the use of the tools. And so we're, we're sort of spiraling into this singularity, potentially, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, and in the process, we may not be what we were or we may be becoming what we already were. I mean, that's where it gets this whole mm -hmm. Trinitarian perichoresis, I think gets um, interesting potentially. Because uh, if you expand that from the very limited domain of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you extend it into this, you know, infinitely sheet folding world lines, donatology kind of existence, that's very interesting. <laughs> that's very weird. Uh, and... I mean, I, I do get excited about the technology because here, here I am having a certain experience with you all, which is meaningful to me. Uh, and there is a limitation to it because just th the physical media aspect of it, you're on a screen, you're at a fixed focal distance from, from my face. We're not, you know, sharing a, a very rich multidimensional experience together, but that could change very quickly. We may in five years be doing this using some kind of virtual reality technology where we could actually choose what the space is like, where we are located in it, where we actually feel like we are located in a virtual space. And, uh, you know, do we want to be uh, in Paris? Do we want to be on Mars? That may be an option. Uh, it may be a consumer option and just something that people, you know, become, becomes a market uh, for space, um, which is where the big data and all that gets, kind of, I think, pretty relevant. Well, I'm just curious. You said this is an, a meaningful experience, what we're having. Mm. Well, when it's a meaningful experience, what produces that meaningful experience? Is it the technology? Or is, I doubt, I would doubt that. I'm answering the question. I'm, yeah. But you, I have a response to that. Well, what's meaningful? It's going to vary from moment to moment, from day to day, from each individual, what's going on. And I, I would agree, this is a very meaningful experience for myself, but I doubt seriously that the meaningfulness is produced by the technology. It can, comes through this mm. technology, which is providing us with an opportunity, but the technology isn't creating this. Uh, and I think that the womb and the experiences of the womb and as we're born and as we learn how to walk and talk and hold hands and give someone a kiss, you know, move in from a dark room to a, a, a lit area, those kinds of experiences are profoundly nonverbal. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think a computer is going to take over anytime soon to give me those kinds of satisfactions of holding hands with someone I love. Um, maybe. You know, I'm, I'm, I want to be open-minded here, but I think the technology can add something to our experience, but I don't think whatever's meaningful is supplied by the technology. Anyway, that's my spiel. I've sort of answered my own questions, <laughs> but I would enjoy hearing anything you might want to add or subtract. I, I would agree completely. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there are many who are 
um, uh, may whose first kiss may not be with a human being. You know, may be with the, <laughs> it may be with the the you know the robot, and that may be meaningful. Is that a kiss though? Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember my first real kiss. I remember her name. We were playing spin the bottle. She was wearing braces. <laughs> um, and that I, I, I claim is a real kiss. Mm-hmm. I don't think kissing a computer, no matter how attractive, mm-hmm. it's, it's not the same thing. Maybe it will be for the next generation or the generation, but it isn't for the generation that I'm um, in a journey with. Mm-hmm. I have a friend who's very ill right now. He has Parkinson's disease. Um, he's not going to be around for very long. Uh, and we, he's been ill for a very long time. But I knew him many years ago, and I know him now. And there's something going on there that, you know, technology has provided a one, some wonderful opportunities for him um, to uh, function at a very high, high level. And he's cognitively quite advanced person. But I'm just like, you know, there's just so much this technology is going to do for us on the plus side, and there's a lot it can do for us on the negative side, like the overuse of antibiotics, which of course is very useful. But I think um, we're seeing the microbial world starting to fight back, and uh, they're going to win if we continue this war on the microbial world. Um, we're, we're creating these, um, these resistant tuberculosis is coming back, resistant mm-hmm. to antibiotics. And it's gonna take more lives probably and previously, these are some of the worst predictions, but maybe not. I mean, I think our minds are extremely powerful and our imagination is very powerful and how we use this technology has a lot to do with how we use our imaginations and what's meaningful to us. Mm-hmm. And that's hard to figure out these days because you know, not many people are paying much attention to what's in their, in, in the, in mm-hmm. their environment. And a lot of the people are, be, I think, getting decoupled from the environment with this technology. And that could be very dangerous on a very large scale. Well, you can barely walk down the street. <laughs> you, you know, people almost walk into you because they're looking at their phones. Um, or get hit by a car. I've saved so many people's lives. <laughs> hooked up to their devices. I said, In the herd. I've stopped the car from hitting them because the guy who was driving the car was hooked up to his devices. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I'm not joking. No. However, so, when I was a boy, I used to run into, into uh, telephone poles because I was reading a book along the road. <laughs> That's a da- books are very dangerous okay, technology. Okay, Jeffy, what do you mean as a boy? Huh? <laughs> I think the last time I did that was about four days ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Michael, you look like you have something to say, and then I think I want to just turn to our kind of concluding section of the conversation before uh, before the um, one thirty my time. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, you, you, hit, you hit this Heidegger technology thing. So I, have a, I don't know how to reconcile all that's been said. I'll just put it in the space and see what happens, you know, leave it. So, you know, I've tried to think about what Heidegger was saying, or how, if, what technology's relationship is to traditional instruments. And so this is sort of barring a, a weak version of Max Weber and Heidegger. So Weber spoke about um, traditional relations of means and ends, very coupled traditionally, where there'd be an instrument moving to some good or value. The end would have a value to it. And that somewhere in the 17th century, um, an instrumental rationality emerged more powerfully. It was very powerful because it could hold the end and now more than before bracket the means, the technique, and then create ever new techniques to produce that in more efficiently. But then in this story, something went amiss. This, the focus on creating new instruments got so strong, a kind of decoupling happened where the value was to create ever stronger instruments without as clear a sense of what particular diversified goods they were going to serve. And this then spins out of control into a logos or logic of technique where ever more refined instrumentality tied to maybe unconscious values like profit or so on takes off and the specific goods these are tied to in which those goods are reflected upon moral discourse or an aesthetic discourse 
almost completely falls away. And then you have systems that are producing this, so you're in a logic of ever new techniques that are not clearly attached to clear, deep senses of the good in institutions. And then we're surrounded by this. To give one quick example, I remember when they put computers in our classroom without having any idea how to use them to make education better. <laughs> mm -hmm. That idea. And then at one point, there was an overuse of PowerPoint through that that was actually damaging learning experiences. Um, so let's try this. Let's try that because we have to use the computer. This would be one little example of it. So that's, that's the way I've been more simply than you are articulating thinking about technology. Mm -hmm. Very good view. Thank you. All right. Um, quick on that. Just a thought that arose. I mean, the efficient, deficient, Geb series, mental. Maybe the problem with mental is not that it's deficient, it's that it's hyper efficient. It's hyper efficiency has become a self consuming structure. Just a thought. And, no, 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 no. Maybe efficient is a kind of a loaded word, too. If you apply mm -hmm. efficient to each structure, just think, just, I was just kind of noodling on the back of my head, like deficient. Maybe deficient, yeah, I'm lacking something. That makes sense. Maybe proficient, like good at it. Good at it. Good yeah, at it. good at it. Proficient. You know, maybe that would yeah. be a better translation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. proficient. Like, you know, um, planting the seed and throwing some water on it, you know, using a hoe. But, you know, agrarian's better. And then modern technologies are really good at making that seed grow under varying conditions. It's proficient at getting that plant to grow. But it's losing sight of really what the good, human good involved is with growing that plant. That's <laughs> the wobble. <laughs> yeah. yep. So you can use the technology, but I'm... I'm not going to stop praying. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I want to get a, become a more skilled, more skilled at prayer, prayer and yeah. using my imagination, which yeah. is a form of a high level form of prayer. That's great. We can do both, and we can do both at the same time. In a sense, our gathering here through this technology is a form of prayer. In in a sense. Yes. It please let God. Please let it work and connect and make it. <laughs> <laughs> It is. It is. I, I, I show up for it prayerfully. Uh, so um, I feel it's a form of communion too. And uh, yeah. I have appreciated these last nine meetings and it's been very interesting as well to see how they've transmuted, you know, from instant, instance to instance and with the different mix of characters that, that we've had and the different chapters, the different themes, etc. So I'm glad that we're going to continue. Uh, I want to open the question whether really just time and space. Is this a good time? Is this a good space? Are there other people that would be good to have in the conversation? Is there an, you know, this is a good number, I feel, actually. Five to six, it gets too many. You don't get to hear from everybody. It's too few. You don't get as much circulation of energy. So I, I, I just, we don't have to have a full conversation now. We could just open a few questions. I'd like to hear what your questions are and see how we could evolve this into a more proficient space for purposes that we share and that we can resonate with. Um, and I don't have all the answers to that other than I want to help facilitate whatever uh, we uh, inter-intelligently decide. Well, I've learned a lot from Schlatterdijk. I've, I've learned a whole lot more from you guys. You guys have all taught me something. So... I think this is a great group. It's been a great adventure. So thank you all very much. And I'm looking forward to the next, whatever happens next. Hmm. I would be disingenuous if I told you I was going to read the next book. Because I'm not. I'm not reading two. I'm not reading three. I'm not reading what comes after. I read the one that came before this. I've had enough. <laughs> the price performance ratio is for me too inefficient, if you will. But if you guys decide to go on and do this, um, it could be that I just show up and obviously learn uh, to hear what you're talking about, because I will repeat what John said. Anything I've learned has been in spite of Sloterdijk and not because of <laughs> <laughs>
but it's but it's more than it's it's more than enriching to listen to what you folks have to say and and bringing out things whether I know what you're talking about or not because I don't always understand what he's saying but it that's that's part's very helpful to me so I I could possibly show up every once in a while just to find out whether you guys have completely lost it or uh, are just moving along in the in the way I think the way I can envision that you would be. Right, any other thoughts? Um, I'm with Ed on this one. I'm not sure if I could do the second book. Um, <laughs> I'd be more interested in the book that Michael and John are reading right now. <laughs> For example. <laughs> We're working on that. Yeah. This, um, another reading. And I mean, right now this time works um, in the fall. It's not going to work as easily. Um, this is, it starts at two o'clock Eastern time for me. Um, and I, I'm going to have some engagements in the fall. that's going to make it tough for me to do it during business hours. So um, just throwing it out there. If there's a different early morning time frame on the East coast or a late night time frame on the East coast that we can look at, that would be great. But to John, to uh, Ed's point, if I can't, participate live i will probably check in uh watch the recordings and then mm, yeah, yeah. Comment, comment on the forum <laughs> the peanut gallery <laughs> for us how do you do this this is good by the way i i i want differentiation i i want us to be re- i want different people to be reading different things and kind of mm. getting you know not non-local echo effects uh yeah. i think in terms of the space I want to cultivate, I, w- I would like more bright minds to interact uh, resonantly in, in, in a generative way. I, that's, uh, that's part of the experiment for, for, for me in this. And I pick up things like signals, phrases uh, that somehow in the you know, phantasmagoria of my, of my mind are, are nourishing uh, to me and become a milieu. That, that's really what I'm personally, my desired outcome is a milieu, is uh, a, a sonosphere of, of interesting and, um, you know, stimulating conversations. So uh, I'm, uh, however this wants to unfold, I want to be here to facilitate it. Mm-hmm. And anyway, I'd, li- I'd like to hear also from Jeffrey and, and Michael uh, as to what you think. So in my case, um, Slutterdyke Volumes 2 and 3 are on my high-priority reading list, and I'll read them anyway, mm-hmm. whether there's a group there or not. So I would prefer there to be a group, <laughs> because I, I get much more out of Slutterdyke when there's all these other ideas coming in and enjoy it so much more. So I would, I would love there to be a group to keep going. I would like a break. Uh, maybe you know skip one one in two weeks and do a start off in a month you know the beginning of you know middle of september or something just to have a little bit of a breathing room before getting into volume two but um and 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 try and and maybe we can try and rope some other victims into the exercise um (laughs) for volume two it is a different focus yeah but uh, i mean not sure that anybody will read volume two who haven't read volume one and i don't think there are a ton of people who've read volume one so i'm not sure that the (laughs) list of subjects is huge (laughs) yeah yeah I, I, how we space ourselves in time, I think, is a good question, actually. Mm. Uh, I, I like the two-week spacing. Uh, mm. Next year, we, we read very intensely. Intensively, We did two hangouts every week, and we, we really burned through the book. And oh, yeah. I think that was a mis- could have been mis- That might have been a mistake. I, I think Gebster deserves much more. Any thinker deserves some space, really. Mm. And it takes time for uh, ideas to really mature um so i I like the two weeks i would like to actually wait a little while too starting in mid-september would be sounds good actually nice Uh, i have some other things i want to read uh i have writing that i that i want want to do and the the, the writing is the reading isn't easy for me uh it doesn't take it's not heavy dense text like gebser was very grueling actually to to, to work through yeah you're not reading them in german yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or, or French. I find it hard in French. Yeah, I told you at the beginning the, the English translation is readable. 
That's good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, all right. And I guess the other thing I'm thinking, too, is in terms of time, uh, this is not a bad time for me, but it's not a great time for most folks in North America uh, mm -hmm. who, you know, have jobs. Um, and so if not participants are not all, if, like, Ed, if you're, if you're not going to participate, then we you don't can have to worry. Day, for example, we could do it in the yeah. evening, and that might yeah. open it up to, you know, some other folks. Right. Uh, of course, you know, we'll continue to record the videos, post them, the yes. forum, other, uh, this time slot could be open for an another, um, another type of, uh, discussion, uh, Arthur Young or whatever else. Trans yeah, we're talking about that. Arthur Young or maybe Bucky Fuller, you know, mm -hmm. you know some sort of seminar. Kind of I'm stuff. certainly open to the Arthur Young, uh, exercise. That would be, oh, good. Uh, Okay. Well, okay. Mr. Fuller is a bit of a different uh, kettle of fish. For me, but yeah. <laughs> I just and don't he's, know. He's short, too. It's a short book. Which so, one? Yeah. Um, uh, Reflexive Young. Universe. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's only 250 pages. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a walk in the park. <laughs> no, well, we can follow up with that in the, in the forum. Uh, we, okay. Why don't we tentatively and, say, uh, we'll yeah, we can work that out on the forum. Okay. Okay. What do you think, Mike? Uh, I'd like to continue with the Slaughter Dyke. Hmm. I feel like he's a, he's a contem significant contemporary theorist. Um, this is his central work. Uh, I'd like to complete it. Doing with others would make me do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, me too. I, I have an issue of time. Uh, my evenings are taken up, and I would want to defer to others completely. Okay. Well, why don't we uh, figure out the time? Uh, and I'm pretty flexible right now, so I have no I am, issues. I am as well. I, I'm. I, I, uh, I'm going to end this recording. I'm going to stop the recording right now, and um, maybe just we can continue for another minute or two. Okay. Uh, for anybody watching this recording, thank you. And, thank you. Uh, you could uh, you can join us. Uh, okay. You can comment on this as well in the forum at infiniteconversations.com, and. Um, to be continued, right? So I'm going to stop the recording and...